Hello and welcome to Airheads, a not so serious look at the serious business of royal rumours, gossip and gowns. I'm Tom. And I'm Maeve. And this week, Prince Andrew is happy to identify as a party prince. (laughs) We've got to start with Prince Andrew today because there's just so much mess around him again, as usual. Every week. But this week we got more ridiculous excuses from Prince Andrew's team. You might remember that last week we talked about how there are now two witnesses who say that they saw him in Tramp nightclub with Virginia Roberts, the woman who says Jeffrey Epstein forced her to have sex with Andrew when she was 17. So this was in March 2001. And now that these witnesses have come forward, Andrew's friends have had to come up with some more excuses. And this is a pretty stellar one, I think. So now his friends have gone to the Telegraph to say that Andrew actually went clubbing so often that it would be impossible to tell what night you actually saw him in Tramp. And this is from the man who says, I never have really partied. I mean, we all remember that moment, that stupid moment from the Newsnight interview where he was arguing pettily with Emily Maitlis over what constitutes a party. This definition (laughs) gets more and more complicated. But now he is happy to reclaim the title party prince and to let it be known that he was a regular at Tramp nightclub. We have a friend of his telling the Telegraph that he visited Tramp nightclub a lot at the time and this insider suggests that while eyewitnesses might have seen Andrew there they cannot possibly be sure which female acquaintances he was with. (laughs) So like part of um, what the witnesses say is that they they saw him with a woman who looked very unhappy so I'm reading from this that he was with so many women who looked so miserable at being in his company that you can't possibly tell which woman it was which is a real ringing endorsement. The source points out that Andrew was at Tramp for a birthday party the same week as he is said to have been there with Virginia Roberts for one of the Sangsters. This is this guy, Guy Sangster, who's the son of a racing tycoon, Robert Sangster, and he was turning 40. Andrew was photographed at Tramp on the 13th of March, which is 72 hours after... It's alleged that he went there with Virginia Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell. Apparently, he was accompanied by Fergie on this occasion. And this picture appeared of him speaking to Guy Sangster's wife, Fiona, in Tatler magazine. Now, supposing he went there a lot, maybe he was there twice the same week, you know. Yeah, they need to get this straight, really, don't they? With two equally miserable looking blonde women. (laughs) But his friends are trying to say that because it's now 18 years later and while Andrew would definitely be memorable, like if you saw a member of the royal family, you would be likely to remember that. They are saying it would be unlikely for them to be sure the woman he was with was Virginia rather than just another female friend. But his memory of Pizza Express, on the other hand, can't be caught into question. Yeah. Like... What the fuck is going on here? It's just outrageous to go from his, like, bumbling excuses in the interview that he doesn't party, he didn't hang out with Epstein to go clubbing, and then when that wasn't working and everybody was making fun of him, they were like, okay, let's just say he actually does party so much that you can't distinguish one side of him from another because you were seeing him every night of the week. Well, one event that he definitely wasn't at this week was the first pitch at Palace, or sorry, pitch event since he stepped down. So that was on Wednesday and they held it at the Corinthia Hotel, which is a very swanky five-star hotel in London, rather than at St. James Palace, which is where it was previously meant to be held. I wonder what could have possibly led to this. (laughs) I, I, I think it is most likely, as Amanda Thursk said, to have been the general election that caused this change of venue. This was such a curious explanation from her. We've talked about Amanda Thirsk before. She's, or she was Andrew's private secretary and his most senior aide. She's said to have been instrumental in setting up the Newsnight interview. And 
as far as we had heard, she had resigned and was said to be taking up a role in running Pitch. So Pitch is Andrew's sort of baby, (laughs) his like Mm. favorite project and one that he's really keen to keep going despite having himself withdrawn from royal duties. So while this event was going ahead this week, he had Amanda send out this very interesting email where she said, due to the general election, the event will now take place at the Corinthi Hotel. Like, simple as that, just due to the general election. <laughs> no idea what would be going on with the general election at St. James's Palace. Like, the, the Telegraph had one of the investors who was attending saying, I can't believe they're actually carrying on with this. We expected it to be shut down. It seems unfair to put the startups through it when the pitch name is now so tainted. He also skipped the Grand Day Guard's annual dinner, which was also a big deal. He was meant to be a guest of honour. Um, he has like an honorary position in the Grand Day Guards. He is a colonel. Uh, he got that in 2017 when Prince Philip retired. But his absence from this party is notable as after he stepped down from the royal duties, it was made clear by courtiers that he would retain his honorary positions in the armed forces. But it looks like what they don't want him there or it's been decided that He's still too much of, like, a stain on the household. Yeah, this story was in the Daily Mail, and the source they were speaking to was some military insider. And from how they were speaking about it, it seemed to be quite a surprise that there was a chair left out for Andrew at this dinner, and he didn't turn up. So you wonder what's going on behind the scenes, and we'll come back to this in a moment when we're talking about Princess Beatrice's wedding. But first, we need to talk about a really horrible story in Sunday Times today that has claims from one of Epstein's victims, another one, who has said that one of Epstein's assistants used the chance to meet Prince Andrew as bait to lure this girl to Epstein's private island when she was only 15. So this woman who refers to herself as Jane Doe 15, she said that she'd already been sexually assaulted by Epstein um, in New Mexico on his Zorro ranch. And she turned down this invitation to the island out of fear. But this makes so much sense. Like, we've heard Andrew give these very noble declarations that he was like a trophy friend to Epstein and that he didn't know what was going on because Epstein would have hid it from him because he wanted so much to impress him. Mm. And, you know, obviously Epstein was getting something out of this friendship with Andrew. And it makes a lot of sense that he would use Andrew in this way. And that when you're talking to girls who are 14, 15, 16 years old, that the idea of meeting a prince, meeting a member of the royal family, is going to be a big draw. And I think, you know, Andrew trying to use this to explain away his relationship with Epstein has just drawn him further into this investigation, like even on his own stated terms that he was there as a trophy friend. Because this woman's lawyer, Gloria Allred, who represents a few of Epstein's victims, she has said, and she was directing this at Andrew, your prestige and reputation were directly touted in his attempts to engage in further harm. So absolutely linking the actions of Epstein to Prince Andrew's presence or friendship. Um, She also repeated her call to Andrew to speak to the FBI. She said, Prince Andrew has taken the decision that he's done nothing wrong, so why would he hesitate to speak to law enforcement? Is he afraid he might incriminate himself? What does he have to fear? His whole point of doing that Newsnight interview in the first place was to show that there was nothing to see here and it was all above board. But again, as we've said several times since then, it has totally backfired and now everybody is wondering what else is he not saying? But (laughs) in probably the most ludicrous news that we heard this week, according to the Sunday Times, Andrew is still planning to do the church walk photo at Sandringham on Christmas Day. Like, this to me makes it very clear that the Queen is still standing by him, that for all the nonsense we've heard about her taking decisive action and forcing him to step down and firing him and, you know, all of this stuff about her being totally in charge and Mm. doing everything she, she needs to, being relentless in protecting the crown, it's bullshit she has no intention of 
cutting Andrew out of the public image of the royal family. Like, fair enough, okay, she wants her favourite son to be there at Christmas, but just keep him in the house. He doesn't need to go to church with you. He can stay back and, I don't know, watch a DVD while you go. (laughs) He doesn't need to be walking. But clearly, she doesn't believe that these allegations are bad enough or serious enough to mean cutting him out. Which is reprehensible. Yeah. But in this piece in the Times, they called it a litmus test of the public mood. As if, you know, anybody is going to be bothered to spend their fucking Christmas morning Mm. trekking out to bloody Sandringham to protest Andrew, to boo Prince Andrew in front of all these mad royalists who have shown up to spend their Christmas watching a bunch of royal family walk to church. Like, nobody's going to fucking do that on yeah. Christmas of all days. Yeah, yeah. Like, it's infuriating that she thinks that this is is an effective way of testing how the public actually feel about Andrew. When we've had all of these polls in recent weeks that shows, what, like 8% of people believe he was telling the truth? You know, that is a damning indictment of him. Yeah. She shouldn't need to see people showing up. You know, the reason everybody's going to be there is because... Prince William and Kate Middleton are going to be bringing their kids for the first time. Yeah, and she knows that. And she knows what kind of effect it's going to have on them if Andrew was there. You know, Kate doesn't want pictures of her and George and Charlotte and Louis with Prince Andrew hanging around in the background. She is going to be doing everything she can to steer clear, to organise some kind of, (laughs) like, arrangement where they're nowhere near each other in any photos. Because you don't want those pictures on the front pages the next day. You don't want those... You know, the first time her kids were in this Sandringham photo, like church walk photo, to be be fucking Andrew lurking in the background. It drives me crazy. And it's again, you know, we've said so many times now, people keep seeing the, the queen as this very sympathetic figure. She's taking a very active role in protecting Andrew and trying to rehabilitate him and trying to make sure that his reputation and his legacy aren't affected by this which you know it's too late it's completely too late (laughs) there's nothing she can do about it and all she's doing is spreading that to the rest of the royal family by taking it on herself as we saw in the days after the news i interview when all of this backlash was really raging it was up to prince charles to have to step in which i i firmly believe he was the one who had the the real hand in getting andrew resigned Mm. and the queen taking credit for it sure but charles is the one who knew he had to go and i wonder will that happen again is charles going to be the one to save the queen from herself and say listen i'm not having my grandkids have their first church walk ruined by andrew so (laughs) we'll see what actually happens on christmas day but i think it would be an absolute mistake So apparently the Queen has also been having trouble writing her Christmas speech, which I think is probably because she's been trying to write letters to the 8% of people who believe Andrew, (laughs) um, and she's been putting off the speech. But a royal source told Vanity Fair, we don't know what the Queen plans to say because we haven't seen the speech yet. It's still at a first draft stage because of the election, but it probably hasn't been the easiest speech to write. It has been a very difficult time behind the scenes, and morale is at a bit of a low Oh, you don't say. A bit of a low, jeez. Yeah. Christmas is going to be so interesting. Like, I never watched the Queen's speech. I've never seen it. Mm. I don't ever want to see it. Except for this year. <laughs> because you have the, number one, the church photo, which we're all going to be watching like hawks. And then what the hell is she going to say in this speech? How yeah. is she going to allude to this? Is she just going to completely ignore it? I think that's likely. Yeah, she's more likely to refer to Harry and Meghan than Andrew, I'd say, in this, in terms of anything negative <laughs> that's happened this year. You think she might try and, and shift yeah. to apportion some of the blame to... Yeah. I think she's she... She's going to throw them under the bus? Yeah, I think she could. I think she could very well talk about the climate or something like that. Like, talk about the environment and some some kind of line about how we all need to be doing better or making better choices or so, something like that. Um, that is, like an indirect but direct dig at Harry and Meghan. I mean, maybe she's going to just be really bland and, like, not say anything, but I think she would be more likely to do something like that than to say, I wish my son didn't hang out with pedos. Best Queen speech ever. (laughs) (laughs) The Queen's biographer, Sally Bedell Smith, was also quoted in this piece in Vanity Fair, and, I mean, said, I guess, what you might expect from somebody of this ilk. She said the Queen has been through worse. 
This is different to 1992, the Annus Horribilis, for many reasons. And while it has been a difficult year, it is not one that could threaten the future of the monarchy the way that 1992 had the potential to do. I mean, why not? But Mm. anyway, the Queen is loved more now than she ever has been, and that counts for a lot. When you look back at 2019, there have been actually some lovely moments with a birth and a royal wedding. It has been a difficult transitional year with some self-inflicted wounds, and I'm thinking of the Sussexes particularly. One hopes that they will use this break to reflect and reassess how they can best serve the monarchy, but overall the monarchy is in good shape. I mean, this made me so angry, though, because in the same sentence, she's saying, don't worry, it was good because Archie was born, yay! And then saying, Harry and Meghan are bringing shame onto the monarchy by speaking out. You can't use the same people to argue both sides of this point. But as we've seen, people are apt to do that. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, it's incredibly frustrating to cite the the birth. And you know they're going to talk about the historic birth of mm. this non-white baby, the first mixed race baby in the royal family. But then when Meghan had the gall to speak out about the criticism of her, much of which is racist, that's out of line. Yeah. So they'll champion their mixed race baby, but they'll chuck their mixed race duchess under the bus. It's it's so fucked. And we saw this as well in the New York Times. They had a piece a couple of weeks ago about how Charles has emerged as a king in waiting, as if he hasn't been that for like 70 years. (laughs) But they had the royal expert, Penny Juner, who you might be familiar with from us talking about her before, saying that what Buckingham Palace needs to worry more about is Harry and Meghan. That reports of strain between Harry and his brother, Prince William, and of Meghan's struggles to adapt to her new life are more damaging because these young royals symbolise the House of Windsor's future, not its messy past. And she said this, for them to be breaking away from the family does have implications for the future of the monarchy. They're going to her family for Christmas. They are not breaking away from the family. Yeah, it's very frustrating. And we've seen stories this week about how Kate and Will are doing the dutiful thing and putting the family first, unlike those years when they went to Bucklebury and put the Middleton family first. Seeing this stuff about Harry and Meghan is just like, I've kind of forgotten because they've been on their break and we haven't had as much about them, like how angry the (laughs) the treatment of Harry and Meghan has made me. (laughs) I know. We did get a little bit of an update on what Meghan and Harry are doing on their six-week break. (laughs) It was, like, pretty over the top, as you can imagine. There was a piece in the mail about how Meghan is in full work mode behind the scenes. This, like, whole thing was so long-winded, and the basic message of it is... Megan is planning a US arm for fundraising for the Sussex Foundation, their royal foundation, which is set to launch next year, which is something Prince Charles has done for years with the Washington-based fundraising arm of the Prince of Wales Foundation. But the language they used in this piece was very curious. So supposedly she's been taking meetings with a PR advisor and close friend, Kelly Thomas Morgan, um, about building this US strategy for the Sussex Foundation. Thomas Morgan is a partner and head of West Coast operations for PR giant Sunshine Sachs, um, who represented Meghan when she was on Suits. And she was at the Royal Wedding. Oh, fantastic. She's working privately, not through the firm. So this does seem like it's a personal relationship, someone that Meghan trusts. It's very interesting that she would go to someone that she knows to help with the plan fundraising, given the, all the uh, stuff s- surrounding the royal family and fundraising at the moment. I know. It, it's Honestly, why isn't this being praised as a very sensible choice, given the royal family's recent track record of yeah. <laughs> dodgy finances and very, very, very bad PR? Yeah, like, what is the Queen going to say, like, Oh, no, Megan, um, I think Andrew knows some great people if you're looking to raise money <laughs> in America. Like. But the mail goes to considerable lengths to make all of this sound very sneaky. Yeah, they say sources in Los Angeles say that Thomas Morgan has been secretly assisting Megan on the charity launch and fundraising drive and helping her plot a strategy for the next 18 months. It's understood the royal is very much running things and insists on maintaining complete creative control as well as making all executive decisions. how dare she she wants to raise like a million dollars 
for charity. <laughs> but the way she's doing it is like this villainous master plot that's all taking place in secret. You know, we heard Omid Scobie, the royal correspondent who always gets great stories about the Sussexes, talking on the AirPod, his podcast, about how Meghan and Harry were spending the break doing absolutely no work and that they had agreed that they would actually make this a break, not a working break. So, I mean, I can believe that Meghan would be doing these kind of meetings, but Mm. at the same time, I wonder how much work they're actually doing if they are just taking it as a time to rest. Someone else who was talking about Meghan this week was Sarah Ferguson. Yes. Fergie (laughs) has said that she has been in Meghan's shoes and she still is. Among other things. (laughs) So when Andrew's disastrous interview aired last month Fergie was actually in Saudi Arabia at the MISC Global Forum which is a conference that's focused on young people but while she was there she was cozying up to the Crown Prince Mohammed bin Salman who has been accused by the CIA the United Nations a bunch of other places of ordering the killing of the Washington Post journalist Jamal Khashoggi last year is this like a kind of couples competition between her and Andrew, like, who can hang out with the worst people. And to make it even worse, while she was at the conference, Fergie said, everyone has been so nice here in Rhea. I think that comes from good leadership. Oh. This, like, is this woman absolutely thick? Like, yeah. how little self-awareness, how little awareness of anything do you, like, how ignorant do you have to be to make a, a public comment like this? But, you know, that wasn't the most stupid public comment she <laughs> if you could believe it made while she was in Saudi Arabia she also gave an exclusive interview to Vogue Arabia ostensibly to promote her lifestyle line Sarah Senses which is a range of flavored teas perfumes and fragrance diffusers and if anyone from the Sarah Senses team is listening we would love some samples <laughs> <laughs> you do wonder if Sarah's senses are so acute, how <laughs> did she not sense that this interview was an outrageously bad, <laughs> bad, 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 bad idea? The, the journalist is clearly in the grips of royal sycophancy. We get this quote from Fergie where she says, it's incredibly difficult, but she doesn't just say it. She says it with a blunt honesty that makes her thoroughly endearing. She has nothing to hide. She's been through it all already. She's a survivor. Oh my goodness. Don't call her a survivor. (laughs) And then we get this addition from Fergie. Beatrice always says that I'm the most misunderstood person, she says solemnly. I agree. (laughs) I can I can imagine how solemn that statement was. Really solemn. I mean, Beatrice, keep Beatrice out of this. What is with her parents? chucking her into everything and making her seem like a total fucking idiot. What kind of weird pact has she made with them (laughs) that she's allowed to just be thrown into all these frigging conversations? Vogue Arabia, though, is clearly on Fergie's side. There's a couple of lines that I thought were real highlights where they say she is a tornado of energy, positivity and grace. Get out of her arse. It feels like you have an incredible sense of mindfulness. They say to her in one question. I mean, it's not a question. It's just... I like our statement. I just imagine Fergie like handing out adult coloring books to everyone and little crayons. The most objectionable piece from this whole interview was when she is asked about, like, she, I think the question is like asking her about the work that needs to be done on mental health and how Saudi Arabia could really benefit from greater mental health supports. And Fergie seizes on this as an opportunity <laughs> for some very sneaky spin. Yeah. So she says, when I talk about Prince Andrew, I talk about family because the last six months have been hard on the girls and me to see such a wonderful man go through such enormous pain. He's the best man I know. It's just incredible what he has done for Britain. And it's all nonsense. So I talk about familyhood and I'm very strong about it. The mental health of men is important. And I think it is vital to articulate that more. That last line is repugnant. Disgusting. Ugh. But, I mean, the whole thing is just unbelievable. To say, you know, he's such a wonderful man going through such enormous pain. It's incredible what he's done for Britain. What has he done for Britain? Honestly. Yeah, I mean, this is... It's so gross. Like, the mental health 
of men, the mental health of anyone is incredibly important. But Andrew is not a fucking example of this. She's just trying to piggyback on this topic that she knows is very relevant at the moment and that's getting a lot of coverage and she thinks that they can link it to Andrew, much like Andrew himself did in his news interview where he said the reason he was doing it was because it had been causing him mental health troubles. You know, I'll tell you what is some real fucking mental health troubles was Virginia Roberts, who wrote on Twitter that she has been informed by the FBI that there has been a credible death threat against her. She also wrote, I'm making it publicly known that in no way, shape or form am I suicidal. I have made this known to my therapist and GP. If something happens to me for the sake of my family, do not let this go away. Imagine what kind of a fucking situation you have to be in to feel like you need to make a statement like that. Obviously, this is coming from her. This is her making a claim, but I do find her incredible and you know, I feel incredible sympathy for her. Mm. Beatrice, meanwhile. <laughs> yeah, she's <laughs> finally got a date through for her wedding, which apparently we'll find out in January. The Mail on Sunday reports, we can expect the ceremony to be in early June, as the racing-obsessed monarch has stipulated the date must not interrupt Ascot, which starts next year on June 16th. That's so funny. She's like, yeah, you can have your little wedding, but just don't let it interrupt my my favorite race meet <laughs> nightmare woman <laughs> like. didn't charles and camilla's wedding took place during a big race yeah. and the queen spent most of the reception in a separate room watching the racing rather than same time with charles and camilla anyway does she love racing or hate her family <laughs> So a source close to Beatrice and Eduardo Mapelli-Mozzi said that they will finally announce their wedding date in the second week of January. The date has been described as early summer, just before the summer social season kicks off. Ah, the summer social season, of course. But I wonder, can you announce a date without having a venue? Because (laughs) apparently they still don't have one. They reportedly told their friends last month that they were going to have it in the guards chapel in St. James's Park which is actually where Camilla married Andrew Parker Bowles in 1973 but it seems now that this venue is no longer under consideration. This is a place where only current serving members of the military and their direct descendants can marry but because Andrew has this position as colonel of the Grenadier Guards it meant that they should have been pushed up to the top of the waiting list and As we were saying earlier, Andrew's military position is one that he really prizes and that he's said to be holding on to, even though he's withdrawn from royal duties. But now it looks like maybe there is something going on there that we don't know about. You know, the Grenadier Guards seemed up to now to be happy to still have him as their colonel. They haven't rescinded this position for him. And according to the Mail... The chapel was deemed to be a perfect choice. It was exclusive, yet not traditionally royal, and strike just the right note at a time when the Yorks' prominence within the royal family is in flux. So you wonder why not this place? Because it does sound like that would have been getting a good balance there between being royal, which we know is very important to Andrew, but without being as high profile as Windsor Castle, for example. Or Westminster Abbey. <laughs> You wonder, are Beatrice and Edo going to get married in Italy, where Edo's family has a large estate near Milan? Or is Andrew going to keep gunning for that great British royal wedding? Speaking of luxury venues, (laughs) (laughs) who needs the North Pole when you have membership to the £1,280 a year Hurlingham Club in Fulham? It's the next best thing. (laughs) So not only has Kate been taking these private tennis lessons at this super exclusive private members club, she has also reportedly taken Prince George and Princess Charlotte to visit Santa in the Hurlingham Club. There was a source telling The Sun, the Cambridges are in the Hurlingham Club far more than anyone (laughs) (laughs) realises. The new children's soft play area is great for Happy Prince Louis and other mums of the club are all very discreet. Like, except this fucking one going talking to the sun. <laughs> but it is a little bit sinister that the Cambridges are there far more than anyone realises. Like, yeah. we know Kate does, what, like one or two events a week. So, I mean, where else did we think she was? Like, I can imagine she spends all her time at this private members club. Especially with this this tennis coach. <laughs> Stop. But um, before 
you message us asking the waiting list for new members is closed sorry about that <laughs> you'll have to find your own coach our quote of the week however also relates to the cambridges <laughs> <laughs> We're very excited to watch A Berry Royal Christmas, which is Kate's TV show with Mary Berry. Apparently, during the course of this special episode, Kate tells Mary Berry one of Louis's first words was Mary, because right at his height are all my cooking books on the kitchen bookshelf, and children are really fascinated by faces, and your faces are all over the cooking books. And he would say, that's Mary Berry. So he would definitely recognise you if he saw you today. <laughs> I love this. I loved seeing all the headlines that were like, Lou's first words were Mary Berry. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, wow. It's also slightly framed as though Mary Berry asked Kate, do you think Louie would recognise me? (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, we don't know what context this comes up in, so I'm very intrigued to see how it plays out on the actual (laughs) programme. On to our fit for a queen. The tiaras were out. So it had to be Kate. She was wearing this beautiful navy velvet gown by Alexander McQueen with the lover's knot tiara. Yeah, I'm sure everybody saw the pictures of the like reception by now. But I think among royal watchers, there was a little bit of debate over this lover's knot tiara, which Kate has now worn to this event every year that she's attended since 2015. So I think people were hoping to see a slightly different one. But I wonder, is there a bit of strategy here? Like, has Kate worn this enough now that we see it as a Kate signature rather than rather than immediately associating it with Princess Diana, who was its most famous wearer for many years? What do you think? I mean, that would be a smart move by her. We did see as well a lot of conversation around her dress as being a nod to the Travolta dress, Mm -hmm. the famous midnight blue velvet dress that Diana famously wore when she danced with John Travolta at the White House in 1985, which was actually in the news this week because it was up for auction and it ended up being bought by historic royal palaces for £220,000. It seemed like a little bit of a reach to me. Like, yes, it was the same colour, and yes, it was velvet, but the shape of it was so different. I don't know. I think people are just so desperate to always associate everything Kate wears with something Diana wore, which would drive me up the walls. Mm. But what I loved about this dress, Kate's dress, was that it seemed to be designed specifically to showcase the major, 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 major bling. (laughs) Oh my god. (laughs) So as well as the tiara, also on loan from the Queen, was the... Nizam of Hyderabad, probably pronounced that wrong, necklace, which the Queen received as a wedding gift when she was still Princess Elizabeth. And the neckline of the dress was like this incredible sweetheart neckline. I thought it was so elegant. I really liked how the Foot Girls described the gown as the dress version of the velvet box where the diamonds live, (laughs) which I thought was so accurate. And we also saw Kate wearing her royal order, that yellow ribbon, which has the little mini portrait of the queen on it. But I do think this dress, it marks more of a shift for Kate. Like we've heard absolutely rapturous stories all year about Kate's makeover and her style transformation and all this. But I felt like this dress was very different from what she's previously worn to this event like it was it was a lot more regal more mature she seemed more confident in it more grown up you know this is queen not princess this is kate the future queen yeah as we're now um constitutionally obligated to call her (laughs) compared to those more princessy like the tulle gowns that she has worn for the last few and i loved it i thought she looked amazing She did look very good, but she's not my first in line. Oh, Tom, who could it be this week? You'll all be surprised to hear my first in line is Camilla. (laughs) Uh, Camilla's a great week. Yeah, she's been busy. Um, On Tuesday, she went with Charles to um, a ceremony which marked the commissioning of a new aircraft carrier, the HMS Prince of Wales. A very expensive £3.1 billion aircraft carrier, so, you know... They clearly trust Camilla to look after it. She is lady sponsor of the ship, which is great because it means that at this event, Charles had to walk behind her. (laughs) 
<laughs> I know. I thought it was so funny. Like the Times reported on this as Charles have to, having to suffer the indignity of walking a few steps behind his wife. Did you say already that the lady sponsor is basically the, the godmother of the ship? <laughs> no, I didn't. Another great godmother position for Camilla. Unfortunately, she didn't get to bash any champagne bottles against the hull of this absolutely got, enormous ship. She just put them in a bag. <laughs> she did, however, get this incredible cake <laughs> that had... It was huge, actually. It was an enormous cake. And on it, there were a bunch of little icing figurines of various sailors and of Charles and Camilla. My favourite part, we posted it on Instagram if you want to see, at AirheadsPod. And it has a sailor and Camilla holding up these little signs pointing to Charles that say, this time it's HMS dot 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 him. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, my favourite thing about it was that they put Camilla in a tiny little mini skirt <laughs> <laughs> on, in this icing figurine. It looks like she's just like not wearing any trousers or something. Because it's like a nod to, I think in 2017, there was a ship named after the Queen and they also had a cake that had a little figurine of the Queen that said, it's HMS me. And in that, the queen was also wearing a short skirt. Not this but, short. Though. Yeah, <laughs> this was like they ran out of Mars Pan or something, and they couldn't do the rest <laughs> of Camilla's skirt. It was so funny. And while she was there, Camilla wore an incredible outfit. This like duck egg blue at- outfit that was completed with a sensational hat. So she looked like toad from mario she looked like a duck egg blue mushroom <laughs> <laughs> it was huge and we love when camilla wears these huge hats they're so fun but yeah. i just thought it was hilarious how big and round and smooth it was <laughs> <laughs> we should mention that there was some good bits with charles at this event too although he's not a first in line no he's very much a supporting character here but he um got to meet up with some old shipmates while he was there and they had some pretty dirty jokes to (laughs) share um so he'd invited uh, seven of the former crew from hms bronnington which was the minesweeper that he was captain of in 1976 so these are old pals when he retired from the navy they had put a toilet seat around his neck and just kept making jokes about him being an old man very funny which is you know always funny But at this week's event, they said, (laughs) uh, well, one of them said, this is Danny Mitchell, a former navigator's yeoman. He said, while you're here, you might as well get the doctor to check out your (laughs) prostate. And the former medic from the ship, from their ship, uh, Kevin Ryan, held up his hand and wiggled his fingers (laughs) at Charles. Why isn't there video of this moment? I need to see this. Charles apparently was roaring with laughter at this, by the way. He wasn't, like, (laughs) he wasn't offended by it. But I loved that this guy, Danny Mitchell, is pretty funny. He lives in New South Wales now, and he told the Times, I've flown here from Australia just to be here today, and I wouldn't have done it if he was an arsehole. (laughs) He's a bloody good bloke. (laughs) So funny. I liked as well that some papers reported on this, and they just included, I've flown here from Australia just to be here today. He's a bloody good bloke. But the best part of this is I wouldn't have done it if he was an arsehole. It's hilarious. It wasn't Camilla's only event this week. She also put her Christmas tree up. This marks the eighth year in a row that she's had help putting up the tree. So she (laughs) is patron of two charities. Uh, One is the Helen and Douglas House and the other is Roald Dahl's Marvellous Children's Charity. So they both help families cope with the challenges of looking after ill babies, children or young adults. But there was a special surprise at this one. She said that they should all go outside and see if there were some friends waiting for them. And those friends were two reindeer, Dancer and Blitzen. Can you imagine a better Christmas surprise than Camilla Parker Bowles presenting you with two reindeer? (laughs) Yes, and while she was doing it, she was wearing the very festive outfit that she wore to meet the Trumps last week. (laughs) The same very bright red dress and black cape. We posted a picture of her with the reindeer as well on Instagram at AirheadsPod if you want to see that joyful moment. Next week, we will be covering the Berry Royal Christmas special, which is on tonight, if you're listening to this today, on BBC One. We'll also be talking through our most memorable moments from the year, the highs and lows. And we'll also 
have a Royal Book and Film Club with our reviews of Jasmine Guillory's Royal Holiday and Christmas Prince, The Royal Baby. Yes, so please do come back and join us. Thank you so much for listening. You can find us on Instagram and Twitter at AirheadsPod and on Facebook at AirHeads. If you like the episode, please rate and review us wherever you get your podcasts and tell a friend. Have a great week. Bye. I never have really parted.